That was going to be a hard question. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, so I get a volunteer to read chapter 16, verses 17 through 20. So, do you see a difference between this and chapter 14? Do you remember chapter 14? Wasn't <clears throat> chapter 14 talking about peace, get along? There is a line. Yeah. So I think in 14, primarily talking about non-essential salvation issues, but uh, here Paul is flipping over where we're talking about the apostles' teaching. Okay. And there is a line. <clears throat> we are to follow the apostles' teachings. Um, so I want to get that clear because there is a definite distinction. So what is Paul's warning here? What's he telling us? What are some of the things that he points out? Um, some of the t- topics, bullet points, you would say, in addition to what Lisa just said. <clears throat> These are things, you know, he just went through how important unity was in the church. And the last thing he wants is things to happen that are going to cause disunity, <clears throat> um, divisions, and hindrances. He says, I don't know what some of your versions are. Mine says, uh, uh, keep your eye. It's a new American standard. Um, anybody else have a different translation? What would that mean? <clears throat> First of all, who is he addressing this to? He's talking to ev- everybody, right? It's not just uh, the elders or something, because we don't even know about that, but he's addressing it to the whole church. Um, watch for those. Keep an eye. So it's kind of like. On one hand, I want to say Inspector Clouseau with the little magnifying glass. <laughs> um, but be vigilant, you know, mindful, uh, not sleepy, uh, but be alert for things that um, are contrary to the teachings of the apostles. Um, be alert to things that cause dissension and trouble in church. Um, what else did he say? What, do you, what do you sh- our reaction to that? How are we supposed to respond?
sure, obviously, you know, which means we need to be awake, what's going on around us, you know, uh, to separate yourself, you know, to avoid that, being pulled into that. Uh, what does he say in verse 18? They were not slaves to Christ. Who are they slaves to, basically? <clears throat> yeah, their own, kind of what their interests are, what they want to push, and so forth. Um, and so, on the other hand, what does bring unity? At least it mentioned something um, about verse, I think it was 19. <clears throat> What brings unity in the church? Obedience. Okay. Obedience to what? God's word. God's word. Okay. So, um, and we just talk in this application would be the apostles' teachings, right? And so that's that's where our unity gets the foundation of, right? <clears throat> um, doesn't mean we're all going to think. That on everything the same always but there is uh, teachings of the apostles that is the foundation of where we are and what we believe and what we follow <clears throat> and so that that's you know truth um, not my truth or your truth that's God's truth what we're looking for and that should be what is common among us um, so the the doctrine is the basis of our unity um, <clears throat> and our fellowship with each other, which is what connects us, because we have that common nality between ourselves. John kind of says this in 1 John 1, 5 through 7. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we will lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Christ. The son cleanses us. So I think to paraphrase, I mean, our fellowship is based on our fellowship with, that we commonly have with Christ. That allows us to have fellowship between one another. <clears throat> so any other thoughts here? <clears throat> yes. <clears throat> You saying to avoid it or not to avoid it? Uh, well, I'm not. I don't know. Well, yeah, to avoid it. Well, he says avoid them. Okay. Um, maybe if they're, I don't know. Maybe if they're coming and trying to start uh, some new teaching or whatever, you can. I think we understand that. Um, yeah, Katie. says so that I can 
able to decipher like, okay, I think that um, that is not good and holy and true. Um, and if I don't know the word of God, then it's harder for me to read that. Yeah, very good. And it's, you know, we've read that previously. If we go back to uh, 15 verses 4. I think we talked about this last time. This kind of came out of the blue. But he says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and encouragement of the scriptures that we might have hope. So <clears throat> it's a reference to scripture that it's relevant in how important it is that we need to know it. <clears throat> um, there's other places in the Bible that talks about scripture and how important it is to know it. Um, I think that ties in what Lisa said, I think, about being wise uh, in verse 19. What does that mean? I, to be wise, I need to know what God's word is. I mean, this idea about avoiding, he says avoid, which seems to be a little strong considering previous chapters he's talked about peace and getting along and uh, the weak and the strong. You know, I think when we talk about avoiding um, I know it's kind of a gray area, but <clears throat> um, he talks a lot about love, too. And the idea of avoiding may be um, having a discussion about what's being taught and trying to get a better understanding of Scripture is one thing. Um, versus avoiding and basically totally shutting a person out. Um, I'm thinking of the example of Paul and Peter. When Peter was falling back in his old ways, um, Paul corrected him publicly and talked to him. Um, he didn't uh, reject him and so forth. Um, didn't stay away from Peter. Uh, he wasn't going to let what Peter was teaching um, affect him, and he tried to correct uh, Peter. So there's a, a balance there about avoiding. <clears throat> so, hand up, Luke. Yeah, that is strong. Yeah. Again, context what we're talking about. And I think we talked earlier, you know, I know we did about our conscience, you know, following our conscience. Don't, um, don't violate your conscience. There seems to be, that could be a problem. I've got conscience about something, and, uh, but then I'm told here about <clears throat> that's something I am saying, um, what my conscience tells me is wrong, then I'm supposed to still follow it? Is that what he's saying? Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, okay. I got a couple of hands. All right. kind of sounds the tone that we have here. Uh, Jim? Yeah. 
So this idea of what I was getting at is my conscience, to go back, we better make sure our conscience is right. We can have a wrong, we can have a conscience we think we're right, but it could be wrong. <clears throat> just because my conscience tells me something, um, just like the weaker brother, stronger brother case, the weaker brother really was wrong. <clears throat> Um, even though it bothered his conscience, it was wrong, scripturally wise. Uh, but Paul understood in that scenario how to deal with it. But <clears throat> so he and again, nope. Okay. So, um, what are the characteristics of the troublemakers? I think Lisa mentioned something about that. He points it out. And Jim pointed out a little bit. <clears throat> Verse 18. Talk yeah. Smooth talkers, flattering. What does flattering mean? I like your green shirt. <laughs> Was that flattery or is that true now? <laughs> okay. I'm going to get to you. <laughs> yeah. We, I think we all know what that is. Um, how do we know when that's happening, though? Know? <clears throat> that's the problem. Yes? When someone feels the need to, like, weave flattery into their conversation, like, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you, and you're super smart, so you understand everything that I'm saying, of course, and I'm talking to you and making my points, and once again, of course you understand what I'm saying. And so, like, the need to, like, lift you up and build you up throughout what I'm A lot of smoothness going on there. Yeah. And when they're starting to talk about things, it goes back to we need to be wise and know really God's word. Because, um, I mean, Satan tried it himself to Jesus, to push God's word. <clears throat> Can you think of other examples in the Bible of smooth talkers, flattering talkers? I gave one, Satan. <clears throat> Okay. Thank. I know there's a good one or two. Yes. I think you have to also be careful sometimes because you can say like, "Hey, your hair looks beautiful," and really have a pure heart and say like, "Hey, your hair is beautiful." And when I think about Dan and his job in sales <coughs> and like his good years, um, it's not necessarily his good years because he speaks a bunch of flattery. I, I think we understand that for sure. Um, <clears throat> we're not talking about that example for sure. Um, somebody like Absalom, do you remember his story? <clears throat> he got uh, killed his brother, stepbrother, um, got thrown out of the city, finally came back. I don't remember how the story went. And he had a lot of bitterness in his heart over the uh, situation about his sister being raped. <clears throat> and his father, David, didn't deal with it the way he thought he should be dealt with. So he kills his brother. <clears throat> and um, anyway, he hangs around the city. He's allowed to stay there. And what does he do, though? Do you remember? <clears throat> he says, starts politicking. Remember, he sits at the gate, the, the entry, entrance to the city, I guess. 
telling everybody, you know, if I was king, I would be giving you exactly what you need. I tell me all your gripes. You know, this is how I would handle it. Of course, he's going to give you and tell you exactly what you wanted to hear. Um, and the whole reason for it was he trying to under, undermine the king, his father. Uh, that was just sneaky, inappropriate stuff. And we know what happened afterwards. Um, so that's um, deceitfulness and smooth talking, trying to convince people um, to get on your side, et cetera. Um, even Judas, you know, when Judas uh, turned in Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, Hail Rabbi, and gave him a kiss. And uh, Jesus was arrested right after that. So, you know, smooth talkers, we just need to be wise and aware and not overly Inspector Clouseau with the magnifying glass. I was kidding about that because Paul spends a lot of time on loving one another, accepting one another, being unified, and so forth. So, uh, lessons from Paul here to be watchful, to be wise. Um, and, you know, it does happen on a bigger scale, as Jim mentioned. Um, people have been in the church for a long time. You hear stories of somebody has an idea and they get a following and whatnot. Any other comments or questions? <clears throat> Let's read the rest of uh, chapter 16. It's 21 through 27. Anybody? Please. Thanks, Dave. So earlier, I think there was like 26 people Paul had uh, addressed in Rome, and now he's, these are people that are with Paul, where he's writing, which is in Corinth. What can you say about the relationships based on what we just read here, the quality of his relationships with these people? about Timothy we know about Timothy right a little bit is this the first time he's met Timothy he's been with him for like eight years uh, a long history of working together he considered him as a son he taught him the gospel uh, he used him for special assignments anything else we know about Timothy so they obviously know each other pretty well Tertius, personal secretary, I guess. He's the one who actually wrote, I guess Paul dictated to him. Um, Gaius, if you go back, there's a, a, most people believe that uh, this is the same Gaius as in 1 Corinthians 1.14, which is somebody that uh, it's mentioned that Paul personally baptized, stayed at his house in Corinth. In Acts 19, uh, 28, 29, Paul in Ephesus, when he was dragged out with the mob, uh, there was a Gaius there. In Acts 20, in verse 4, there was a traveling companion named Gaius. And the other names, uh, there were people that possibly were traveling with Paul also mentioned in Acts 20, verse 4. So, I mean, in summarizing, what can you gather with this group of men there with Paul? <clears throat> what do they have in common? Right. 
Somebody say Christ? Yeah. Then in a more detail, um, they probably got possibly uh, thrown in jail together, or Paul had to suffer and they suffered together. Um, they ate and slept together and lived together for the cause of the gospel. You know, basically they were in the same foxhole. And what's I've never been in that foxhole other than when I was a kid, but I've never been in the military, so I would think if you're in a foxhole in a real situation of uh, being shot at and blown up in a foxhole, um, you get real close with people because they're all in the same boat, basically. <clears throat> you need to look out for one another. Um, so in the same foxhole for Christ, sharing the gospel together to the Jews and the Gentiles. So they had a, I would think they have a strong relationship and a lot of history between themselves. So, lessons learned here. <clears throat> the blessings that we have with our fellow laborers, you know. <clears throat> Can you not agree with me on that? A lot. The older you get, the longer you're faithful and involved. The blessings you have with other Christians. <clears throat> um, I've got my list. You tell me some of yours. <clears throat> yes. Sometimes I think of modern letter letter writing. When I think of the epistles, I think of you know Paul sitting down at the desk and writing out his personal letter to his friends in Rome, which is not at all how it happened. And I think these verses are a good reminder that it's more of a community. He's staying at someone's house. He has at least four other Christians with him that might be even giving advice or. Yeah, that, to me that's the foxhole uh, scenario. As I was reading through this, I thought, uh, Stuart, remember our little trip together? <clears throat> and I'm thinking, was that Katrina? Yeah, down in Mississippi. So, uh, and I was trying to think, it was, was it Brian Perry? Was that his name? Went with us? Okay, three of us hiked down to Mississippi going to the Gulf Coast. And so if you remember that, people were just volunteering stuff and we were, were going. <clears throat> Had a trailer full of toilet paper and diapers and gas, gasoline and whatever. Didn't know where we're going, we're just going. And uh, we're on the phone all the way down trying to pick up information where to go. We heard how bad it was. People looting and shooting and no gas, no, you know. Didn't know what we're getting into. Uh, fortunately, Brian, his parents lived down in Mississippi, so we stayed with them for one night and then went on down. Jackson, Mississippi, I think we connected with the church down there on the phone constantly trying to figure out. And I think they knew how the connections to get down to the coast, people they needed, Christians they needed. So we handed off our stuff to them, which really worked out wisely, I think, instead of us going further because they knew how to use it and where it needed to go. But those are memories, relationships, things you go through together, you know? And Paul probably had countless experiences like that. Yes? I think the other cool thing about Paul at like either the end of his letters or the beginning of his letters, and when he's talking about like brothers and sisters in Christ, is like he's talking to a completely separate group, and then he'll hype up someone to that group and like talk about somebody's good works or their good deeds or what they're doing for the faith. Those people, and so then that encourages them. And I think something that's cool that is happening is like he is encouraging these people with the example of others, um, as well as encouraging the people that he's writing writing about. And I think it's like I think it's a cool thing that we can do too in our faith and in our family is to say like I see what this person's doing, or hey, I've, and it's super easy now. We can just shoot a text and say like, hey, I heard that you're doing this for someone. Good point, Jake. <clears throat> Good thoughts. 
Anybody else? <clears throat> Good thoughts. You know, talking about our relationships with each other, uh, our kinship, the things that we uh, suffer together and work together. I get to know Jesse's parents. I don't really know them, but I get to know them. I've heard all about them <coughs> for years from my wife. And then they, they came here and it kind of like I knew them, uh, especially your mom. Um, and Lisa went on about your dad so much. So um, fellow preachers, you know, that come here, you know, Take advantage when they're here. Talk to them, meet them. Uh, just open, ask questions. You get it, you know, they're, they're coming here as a stranger kind of, um, but they've got so much resources to share with you and to encourage you. And they get encouraged, I'm sure, when they get feedback from us, you know. Mo, do you have a question? Because we still have that common adult, commonality between us in our relationship, the foundation of Christ that brought us together in the first place. Gospel meetings are great places to get to know and encourage one another um, and then working together. And in that vein, unless somebody has another question, tell me how can social media help or hurt our relationships with one another? Let me see how much time we have. <clears throat> it's a little too much information, it sounds like. <laughs> yes. Sound like there's some pluses and minuses. <clears throat> but um, thinking what Paul went through in these chapters we've been going through, the weak and the strong, etc. I don't know if uh, the uh, text messaging was available back then, or Facebook, or whatever. It could get a little rough. <clears throat> a lot of uh, talk going on in groups, 
forming up and birds of a feather flock together type thing. Um, I'll talk to you if you got it the same, you're on the same page I am type thing, you know. I was, you know. So you got to be careful. I just thought, you know, what we say, it's easy to blah, throw our stuff out there. <laughs> you got to think a minute, be wise of what we're saying and how it's being received on the other end. Um, and be considerate with one another. Um, <clears throat> Anybody else? Or you're afraid to talk about it? That's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, what's your thoughts on the book of Romans? <clears throat> what's some takeaways you have? <clears throat> what's a word, a buzzword? Some, that, I see some lips moving, but I can't hear. <laughs> yes. Are you referring to the, the Jew-Gentile Jew -Gentile, uh, discussion that Paul had? Yeah. Paul just shuts that down. We're all guilty. We're all fall short. <clears throat> um, obviously, the word grace and mercy are huge in, in Romans. Um, Paul identifies himself in the beginning as, you know, an apostle made by God to address uh, the Gentile world <clears throat> to bring um, the obe obedience of faith to the Gentiles through the gospel. And then Romans 1 16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So Paul is talking about Salvation, he's talking about righteousness with God, which means being right with God, which talks about being uh, right in relationship, being uh, on salvation, kind of the same theme. Um, he looks at it and addresses to the Gentile world, <coughs> where they came from, and from the Jewish world, where they're coming from. Uh, he talks about it right up front. The Gentiles, you guys are full of corruption, <laughs> unrighteousness. Uh, refuse to acknowledge God. You know, worship the creation versus the creator. Jews, you thought you were right with God because of your descendant of Abraham. Um, because of the way you kept the law. But the point is, you can never keep the law. And Paul points out that there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile, for we are all fall short. Um, but we are justified by what? By faith, in faith in Christ and what God has done through Christ. And we have peace through our Lord Jesus. In chapter 5, it talks about 5.1. Uh, 
Even though in Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul talks about the righteousness of Abraham, or the faith of Abraham, and uh, gets down to his trust in God. He recognized his grace toward us, uh, toward him. Uh, there isn't anything we can do to earn it. Salvation is found only through Christ's work, Christ's sacrifice, Christ's resurrection. Righteousness comes by faith, by believing, by trusting, by submitting to, to God and to Christ. Um, and then, you know, a key verse in Romans 8, talking about all this about God's love. 8, 38, and 39, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So that love from God should generate a response from us, um, a motivation in kind to love God back. And Paul explains how we do that by walking in the spirit instead of in the flesh. We'll kind of wrap up Romans next quarter, or next uh, Wednesday, but uh, then we'll get into some parables. So I don't think I have enough time to quite finish. Got any final comments from you guys? <clears throat> okay, thanks for your input.